Okay, well, thank you all very much for being here. Um, so today, Sally and I are going to talk about something at the heart of the intersection of of poverty and, and health, and that is chronic homelessness. Um, you know, the human beings who literally sleep out on the streets, um, you know, on park benches or abandoned bu buildings and vehicles, um, and suffer from a lot of major issues, so substance abuse problems, mental health problems, um, also social issues like disconnection from family, um, dire poverty, um, lots of these really difficult um, circumstances. Um, and so to go into this, we have myself and Sally Saitel, and so we'll be having sort of a, a conversation um, centered around three major questions. Um, question one will be who are the chronically homeless? Question two will be what are we currently doing? And question three is what should we be doing? And I promise those, the second and third ones are not the same thing. Um, there will be differences. Um, and so. Um, after we go through um, kind of these questions in sort of a conversational format, um, then we'll open it up for hopefully a good number of questions from, from you all. So hopefully 10 or 15 minutes we'll save for that. Um, and also argue, I personally like arguments. I don't know how you feel about that, but if you viscerally disagree with something that we say, I would love to hear sort of the, the pushback on that. Um, okay, so, so question number one is who are the chronically homeless? So let's first step back a bit from that even and say, talk about homelessness. Um, so when it comes to homelessness, I would say there's kind of two different types. On the one hand, you have homeless families. And for this, it's you know, usually a single mom, a couple of kids. Very rarely are they found actually sleeping unsheltered on the streets. Um, most often are in shelters. Um, and shelters for families are different than maybe what you often think of as a homeless shelter. So this is usually a, a private room. They may share a bathroom with other people. They can kind of stay in that room or place for a while. They don't have to come in and out each day. Um, in New York City, some shelters are even nicer. They're still not nice, but um, you know, it could be a studio apartment. People stay there and meet a median length of stay is now 14 months in New York City shelters. So, just to kind of set the background that this family homelessness issue is very different than the single adult homeless issue. Um, when it comes to single adults, now you're talking more about people who actually do um, more very frequently sleep out um, unsheltered on the streets. Um, and you know some do sleep in the shelters as well, but shelters for single adults are um, more of what you're thinking of in terms of the congregate facilities. Um, it can be unsafe. You oftentimes have to check in um, at night and leave in the morning, so you can't just um, kind of stay there for a while and leave your things. Um, also, when it comes to single adults, you're talking now about more of the mental health problems and substance abuse problems. Um, so I think it's really important when you hear about homelessness, um, either in the media or among policymakers, um, oftentimes you start out with this vision of the homeless person sleeping on the street, um, and you start to think about policies that would help assist them, but then you start lumping in um, homeless families as well, um, and it's just a very different population with very different solutions, and so I think that needs to be made clear. So now let's talk about the single adults who experience homelessness. So on a given night, there are just under, on a given night in January, there's just under 400,000 um, single adults in the United States who are experiencing homelessness. So that's again either out on the streets or in shelters. Um, I think just under 40% of those, are, or maybe a little over 40%, are are found unsheltered. Um, and again, that's in January, so you might expect that to be different in different points of time, um, perhaps in the summer, in the warmer months. Um, and so um, when you're talking about 400,000, then you know, these are the people who, again, sleep on the streets and shelters. Um, among those 400,000, there's something called chronically homeless. Um, and so when we talk about chronic homelessness, that's people who have been homeless for a long period of time, so at least the past year. Um, or perhaps four different times within the past three years, and who have some kind of disabling condition. Um, so that could be a, um, a diagnosable substance abuse problem. It could be a severe mental illness or some other disability. Um, so these are sort of the, the people that we really think are the most vulnerable, who are really staying out, sleeping on the streets as a way of life, or perhaps in some of these shelters or in and out as it may be, and who kind of warrant the most um, policy response. Um, and so before I get into respond, the policy responses though, and or Sal, I'll let you join in soon too, um, 
but I think it's really important to, to understand that when we talk about sort of these chronically homeless individuals, um, it's not free um, to do nothing. And, you know, it's not free from a human perspective. I mean, I think that we should all agree that these are human beings who really deserve our compassion and who um, are, for a array, array of reasons, just really um, not able to be you know, connected to society. Um, but beyond that, there are kind of more um, economic costs um, to a lot of our other social support systems. So for instance, um, the chronically homeless tend to use emergency rooms and hospitals at very high rates, um, which can add up a lot in terms of expenses. Um, they do more often you know, accessing the jail system, so there's a lot of times people who are homeless, there may be quality of life laws or there may be other um, activities in which people engage which lead them to end up in the, um, into jails, um, which can be expensive as well. Um, when it comes to shelters too, I mean shelters, even though they are not the nicest places to sleep, they can be very expensive as well. There's a lot of um, service providers who take in salaries and those salaries can add up and so um, you know it's expensive even f for shelters so so chronic homelessness is not a um, a cheap thing um, either from a kind of a moral perspective or from sort of a, a cost economic perspective um, and so I guess with that that's sort of my kind of economic -y policy kind of take, but I would really like to get a sense of sort of who are these people, what are sort of the mental health issues that they face when it comes to the chronically homeless, so those who have some of these disabling conditions, what are the mental health problems, what are the um, addiction problems that people face, and so for that, uh, Sally, I would love to get your take. Hi, is this, okay, this is working, right? Okay, so you got, are you guys um, third years, fourth years? Oh, earlier on. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, well, as um, uh, Kevin mentioned, I'm a, a psychiatrist, and I still do some work, actually, in a methadone clinic, and, and uh, also in a courtroom, a court building that has a urgent care clinic for people who um, have psychotic breaks during their trials. You wouldn't believe how often that happens, but, um, and, uh, well, obviously these people are already mentally ill. So, um, but uh, uh, a th about a third of the folks who are homeless, especially the street homeless, are uh, considered mentally ill, and uh, somewhere between 50 and 80 percent have a substance abuse problem. So there's considerable overlap in why we're sharing the stage today. And uh, when it comes to mental illness, you know, the, the classic um, the classic kinds of, of disabling problems are um, the psychotic illnesses, schizophrenia and, and, and bipolar. And both of them will certainly be exacerbated by concurrent substance abuse and uh, cocaine, heroin, alcohol. As you know, um, heroin and opiates are uh, it's a massive problem with that today, and um, putting this putting if you can put substance abuse aside because there's you'll as you start to do rotations you'll see there's so much comorbidity you it's it's almost um, you know it's like finding a you know a white lion to find someone who's just got a pure disorder um, most people have a combination of both but. Um, that, uh, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar illnesses are largely treatable, not, there's a spectrum. Some people respond extremely well to, to medication and others less well, but, um, but the majority of people can get some, definitely some sort of relief and control from these medications, but, but when you're homeless, it's, uh, certainly uh, not, e and psychotic, if you're actively psychotic, um, then about, uh, my colleague Fuller Torrey um, always cites the statistic that about half of all people with psychotic illnesses don't even recognize they are mentally ill. It's, it's almost like a, the equivalent of a neurologic neglect syndrome it, and uh, where they, it's, you know, if a person has a stroke, sometimes, depending on the stroke, they don't even recognize that their arm is paralyzed. Well, this is, they don't even recognize that they're, ment they're, they're mentally ill. So if you don't recognize it, you're certainly not going for help. Um, but there are lots of reasons why people don't uh, go to clinics anyway, 
even if they do realize they're sick, A, they're hard to get into. Um, and, um, and they've often had, a lot of times people have had not, not very positive experiences with psychiatry, unfortunately. Uh, so, um, uh, so even if they, but let's say they do come in, which, which would be wonderful. If you, if you, it, it, there's often limp, literally no place to put your medication. Um, and certain shelters, you know, some are better than others. They, they'll lock up the medication and, 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 and hand it out, but other times they get stolen and there's a little abuse potential to these meds. Not, not much at all, but not everyone knows that. So they get stolen for that and, and diverted for that purpose. Um, so that's, this is all extremely difficult and, and the, the, you could trace it, you can trace much of it back and we don't have time to recite the whole history of uh, the community mental health movement, but um, to frankly the late 50s when deinstitutionalization uh, began, I'm sure you're all familiar with this narrative. Um, it's, it's, it's so common now, it's almost cliched, but it's, it's, it's really painfully true that in the, uh, we used to have, you know, big state asylum for the mentally ill. And then in the late uh, 50s, early 60s, a combination of things, finally Thorazine was finally available, the first antipsychotic available in the late 50s. And that helped a lot of people become stable enough so that they could live in the community. So, so they were released. Plus, there'd been so many scandals of the quality and the you know, snake pits, you may have heard. There was even a movie called Snake Pit, which actually was fairly galvanizing. Then there was a big expose called The Shame of the States in the, um, I think, early 50s, mid 50s. And, uh, and that um, also was uh, just, uh, you know, again, a, you know, a shocking look into how the, the mistreatment of patients, the poor quality of the care, everything. And so there was a lot of pressure to uh, release patients and house them, uh, to deal with them in, in more humane setting, which would be in the community. So between the medications and the, um, the uh, uh, bad conditions and a general ethos at that time of just liberation. I mean, there was, um, you know, the 60s movement and then there became this notion that the mentally ill were just yet another oppressed class like women and minorities and they deserve their freedom. So um, in 1963, President Kennedy, uh, this was the last bill he ever signed before he was assassinated, the uh, Community Mental Health Centers Act, which was supposed to build uh, local s smaller communities f for um, these folks, and that's where they would be treated, mostly as an outpatient. They might have a little bed capacity. Well, to make a very long story short, they did build them, not, not as many as uh, they in was intended, but they did, did build these clinics, but they only catered to people with uh, neuroses, basically. And Freud was still a very popular figure then, Freudianism. And, uh, and so that's who they treated. They also, a lot of these community clinics were interested in community activism. And so the severely mentally ill basically had nowhere to go. And fast forward to today, where there still are not enough beds. Um, the, beds the bed capacity in this country went down from, like, by nine public beds uh, for mentally ill went down by about 90% or more from their peak at the, in the 50s. And, um, and so they end up on the jail, and the jails are in the street. And it's a, you know, it's, it's a terrible problem. I mean, the, I'd say the basic fix for this, uh, and there are many levels at which you can think of a fix. One could just be the shelter system itself, I mean, but is more bed capacity. That's a Medicaid issue, we won't get into that, but, um, but that's how we got to where we are. And um, we're, it's every city is still trying to figure it out. And so it sounds like you know deinstitutionalization plays a major role in you know the homeless we see today. So what would you guess if we still had um, you know forced institutionalization of the mentally ill? Would we still see street homelessness today? Um, how would there be any? Would it be the same as it is now, or would it be somewhere in between? And how how much? Well. Forced institutionalization, um, you know, we, we still have 
We still have that. You can always commit people if they're dangerous to themselves or others. And then states have various degrees of imminence of danger. Some, for some, it has to be you can pr pretty much <laughs> interrupt the bullet before it hits your head. I mean, it's that imminent. And others have a need for treatment standard. That's the most uh, um, relaxed. In other words, somebody is clearly deteriorating. They're uh, obviously not caring for themselves in a uh, constructive way, and the spiral is going down, and then you can, in some states, you can even intervene then and commit someone. And then there's legal review of these kinds of things, and in the intermediate is a grave disability standard where someone is, uh, you know, out on the street in, in negative 16 degree weather in the process of getting frostbite, not, doesn't want to kill himself, you know, doesn't want to hurt anyone else, but clearly is in a very dangerous situation. You can intervene then. Um, so we can always do that. The question, the, the issue is we can't keep anybody very long. Uh, so that's a big problem. And yes, bring back the asylums. I, honestly, you know, if they were, of course, <laughs> done well. Um, and they can be done well. There are models. Uh, there are some people who, uh, there are some people who just need to get stabilized on their meds, you know, like a um, I'm thinking of somebody with a home, you know, an otherwise, a person with an otherwise, with a, st a family, social supports, insurance, and maybe they need just a week or a few days to respite, I mean, get away from the situation that's probably agitating them even more, get on their meds, go back home. But then there are people who take months and months to, um, it, it, the word is reconstitute, um, Sounds like orange juice. And um, <clears throat> and there's really no place because there are hardly any long-term beds. So I, I do think that would make a huge difference. And in the jails, when you talk about the expense, the jails are incredibly expensive. Emergency rooms are so expensive. And people are staying there for boarding there. Maybe you guys have done some ER work. You know, in the hallways, sometimes for, for days, uh, it's it's... It's bad. So I do think that more bed capacity would make a huge difference. And you could have, there's this place I used to moonlight in. I mean, um, I don't think it's closed now. But anyway, it's called Connecticut Valley Hospital. And I mean, it was what this woman Dorothea Dix back in the, the, the 1980s envisioned for humane care for the mentally ill. And then they had no medication at all. But now we have meds, which was a pastoral kind of setting where there were working farms with animals and, and people learn trades. And, and uh, maybe it sounds romanticized, but you know, for, for a lot of people, that was a wonderful situation. Yeah. yeah, so let's talk more then about yeah, this kind of second question of what are we currently doing and then more about what should we be doing. Um, and so kind of taking the world as it is, you know, we don't any longer kind of lock people up who are mentally ill. Um, you know, we have to have solutions to kind of get people into assistance they need. Um, and so out sprouted the last decade or so a solution called Housing First. Um, so if you ever watch The Daily Show, I don't know if there's Daily Show watchers in this crowd or not, um, but they did a segment called, you know, the homeless homed. Um, and essentially it said, okay, well, if you have homeless people um, sleeping on the streets, what is the solution to homelessness? It's homes, obviously. Um, and so that's, you know, for instance, what Utah did. And apparently they had, um, I say apparently because I've done some work trying to actually debunking this, but they had supposedly ended, you know, chronic homelessness through this housing first approach. Okay, so what is the housing first approach? It's not just you know giving people homes. Um, it's something much more expensive and intensive than that. Um, so it actually gives uh, what's called permanent supportive housing. Um, so that means there's usually a nonprofit service provider who provides housing um, that's permanent, um, and they also offer uh, supportive services that go along with that. So mental health treatment, um, addiction support. Um, other types of services and case management as well. Um, but it's provided in a certain way. And so it's provided as in a no strings attached way. And so it's basically premised around, you know, housing is a right for people. And so, you know, there's no conditions for someone sleeping on the streets. You're not required to be sober to get into the housing. You're not for to say you're going to comply with some kind of mental health treatment to get into the housing. But also, once they have the housing, they can stay there indefinitely. They're not ever required to engage with treatment um, to become sober. Um, again, this housing is seen as theirs. They, 
don't have to do anything else to stay in it as long as they, you know, pay 30% of their income, which is usually, you know, their supplemental security income, SSI check, um, they can stay there. And so when I think about whether this is a good model, I think there's three criteria we should judge it on. Um, one, from a sort of policy perspective, is it reducing the size of homeless populations? Um, number two, is it doing so in a cost-effective way? So is it cheaper than other options that we could otherwise use? And number three, does it improve well-being? And despite the rhetoric around housing first, is this, you know, this is like we've invented a way to go to the moon and back. Um, actually, the evidence on this is pretty weak. Um, so in terms of whether it reduces homeless populations, I've done some work on this. Some other people have done some work as well. Um, you don't see an association between communities that increase this you know, housing first type housing stock and then decreased homeless population sizes. And there's different potential reasons for that. You know, maybe the data just are really bad, which I do think the data are really bad. Um, you know, it might be that when you give out, you know, housing to people who are homeless for a long time, that people stay homeless for a longer time in order to qualify for it. Um, I don't think we yet know the reasons, um, but we don't know yet whether, you know, expanding housing first actually does lead to reductions in homelessness. Um, it may, it may not. Uh, number two, does it do so in a cost effective? Is it cost effective? Um, so like we said, you know, homelessness is very expensive through emergency rooms and jails and shelters and hospitals. Um, housing first is expensive too. So the question is what's more expensive? Well, there are cases, there are some people who just are extremely expensive, who are literally in and out to the emergency room on a nightly basis, who are oftentimes locked up in jail. And for some of these people, you really can save money through this housing first approach. Uh, but for the majority of the chronically homeless, you know, you do have some cost offsets, so you save some money on emergency rooms and jails and shelters, but it's not enough to outweigh the, the large cost of housing first. Okay, so some success there, but not, you know, it's not going to save us money. Uh, and number three, you know, does it improve well-being? Um, so we've done some very good randomized control trials to really figure out what's going on, what is the causal effect of housing first. Um, you do see that people are less likely to be on the streets and shelters. So, I mean, maybe it's common sense, maybe not. But I mean, it is a, an achievement that you are getting people to at least come inside. I mean, so you so do see reductions in, you know, in, in homelessness. Uh, but then when it comes to other measures of well-being, when it comes to you know, improvements in mental health, um, reduction in substance abuse, you don't see those things. You're not seeing improvements in these other areas of well-being. Okay, so to me, the evidence looks somewhat weak, right? We don't see that it's reducing homeless populations, at least we don't have evidence for that. Um, it's not necessarily saving money, but it does have some cost offsets. It's not improving other measures of well-being. Um, and so I think when it comes to what we should be doing, so our third question, what, how should we kind of improve our efforts, we have to think about ways to, you know, not only, you know, reduce homelessness in a cost-effective way, which I think are important things, but also remember, you know, these are human beings um, who are, I mean, experiencing some really horrible things. And so we have to make sure that we're improving well-being in a cost-effective way. Um, and so I think there's two ways, you know, kind of two ways to do that. Um, one is you have to, first of all, uh, make sure that you have resources for people in the future. So if you look outside, I mean, you'll see people in every city in the country still sleeping on the streets with a lot of these issues. And so the problem is if you kind of have this permanent supportive housing model, um, you kind of can get people in and get them off the streets. Uh, but then you want to be able to kind of turn that bed over for people in the, in the future. And so if you can kind of improve uh, people's well-being, help them overcome some of their problems, um, then they can you know, move back in with family. They can move back into you know, some private housing with roommates or on their own. And that can save money for more people in the future. OK, so that's the second part, is that you want to improve well-being. And so there's sort of a, an economic case for that. Yes, like it can save money if we kind of help, actually help people. And two, it like matters for its own sake. If we're actually helping people overcome their problems, that's a very good thing. Um, and so to achieve those ends, I think you need a, a new model, um, one that accepts people unconditionally into programs, I think there's this major problem. How do you get people to accept um, support who don't want it? And that is a major issue when you talk about homelessness. And so you have to give them um, some type of services and, and housing that is not initially conditioned on any kind of um, hoops that they need to jump through. 
Uh, but in the longer term, I think you can start to um, impose some strings and requirements. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, I would, instead of saying, yes, you must use strings, or no, you may not use strings to kind of get compliance, I'd rather say, you know, as a service provider, we're going to provide you some funding. Um, let's make sure that we're paying for results. So if you're able to use your kind of housing first model or more of a tough love strings attached model, I don't really care that much as long as you're able to help people, you know, get into housing, um, help them overcome their problems, and then transition them out so that we're not spending money indefinitely. And I think a system like that, which actually gets the incentives right, um, which actually um, rewards programs for kind of getting people in, helping them, and getting them out, would be a more effective way to use um, you know, whatever our limited resources to actually help people and effectively deal with homelessness sort of from a more population perspective. Um, so I don't know, Sally, do you have any other kind of thoughts on what would other be good approaches to going forward on this? And then after that, we can kind of turn to, to questions. Only that um, you get extra leverage if someone's also committed a minor crime, which a lot of these people have. And uh, I, I'm not someone who would necessarily rush into decriminalizing certain things. I'm thinking more about the, the drug arena, although I, I certainly don't endorse in car you know, incarceration for minor drug crimes, but I, but I do think that uh, we have uh, good strategies like drug courts and others, <clears throat> others that uh, um, they, which monitor people. They often require a person be in treatment. There's some some degree of monitoring. There are even uh, there are some rewards. There are even some sanctions, but they're 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 not severe at all. But they're immediate, and um, and that's often very effective. Uh, uh, and um, and then they whatever charges a person has are, are dropped when they complete the program. So it's not that their record is ruined. But the point is it's not to be punitive. But the point is it's it's one strategy for um, behavioral modif you know behavioral change for folks. Again, not if you're hallucinating and you know severely mentally ill, but especially for people with drug problems, incredibly effective. I'll just throw out the name of a one program called HOPE, Hawaii, uh, stands, the acronym stands for Hawaii um, Opportunity Probation and Enforcement. It's just the model for what's now called swift, certain, and fair uh, programs, which are, again, based on this um, behavior 101 you know, strategy, which is, you know, immediate, you tell people what you want, and I, I really like that uh, approach in general, is, you know, you tell accountable people what, or people who should be accountable, what you expect of them, and then you, I don't care how you do it. If you go to AA meetings every day, that's fine. If you need formal therapy, that's fine. If you just want to use willpower, which people use all the time, and it works, that's fine. Just get it done. And if you don't, these are the consequences. In this case, they're not severe, but they're immediate, and they're uh, predictable, and they're fair. Uh, like a, they might be a, one night in, in jail, actually, that's what they use, or some sort of, um, uh, they make them do some sort of task in the courtroom that helps them make it, clean it, or something like that. Um, but, uh, uh, and then the better people do, the less supervision there is, and then finally they're finished after a year to 18 months, and their record is, is clean, and the, uh, I'll follow up. Anyone who's interested can follow up, but the results are pretty, pretty impressive. Anyway, the point is, if, if the person has a, a criminal justice, active criminal justice uh, involvement, use it, because uh, that's, a, that's, you know, another support, another, another constraint. Again, not to be punitive, but to help guide someone and contain them, because these folks in many ways don't govern themselves well. They're for all kinds of reasons, and this is helpful. This kind of in trying to internalize this self-control is so important. Okay, so with that, we have time for a few questions. So if you wouldn't mind waiting until a microphone reaches you. Um, so first, raise your hand. Um, I can call on you and then wait for the microphone. Yeah, right up here in front, you have a question. And state your name if you'd be willing. Sure. Uh, Joshua DeGastine from Georgetown, so I'm a local. Uh, thank you both for the talk. Um, Dr. Saitel, I'm curious what prompted you to first start writing about political correctness in medicine, because just getting in last night, a lot of my conversation with, uh, with other students were about that. And then if you're familiar with the writings of Theodore Dalrymple, how do you encourage um, other people to tell non-PC stories like his or like yours? 
Um, first, I have to correct. I said something wrong when I mentioned that expose. It was 1948. Um, for all you taking notes, <laughs> Albert Deutsch. But um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think it was working at the VA. <laughs> That'll do it to you, I'm telling you right now. Um, it, the disability uh, system there, which is all well-meaning, I think stipulate every, you know, everyone I disagree with I think is well-meaning. Um, but, uh, you know, they, re they really care about the vets and, and uh, th that's why there is disability and uh, it's what's called service-connected payments. But um, in psychiatry especially and in PTSD, so we saw a lot of PTSD guys, the, for so many, for so many of them, the, the uh, monthly check was just making them worse. I mean, they'd never go back. Once you exit the workforce, and you're rehabilitatable. Granted, of course, you're not going to have an expectation of work of someone who's, you know, completely decimated. But, um, but a lot of these guys were definitely rehabilitatable. And yet, then you get, uh, and this is true in many areas of medicine. But it's just most palpable at the, I think, at the VA because so many of the people are on, on do get service-connected um, money. And um, so, so we saw just too many people who were in this, you know, kind of cycle of perversity where they, even those who wanted to, to get a job, they'd been, for so long, they'd been uh, out of the workforce. You know, your confidence erodes and your talents atrophy, whatever they were, and by now you're, you know, whatever talent you had is probably um, out of date, and then they are afraid they'll lose their benefits, so they're afraid to even try it and fail, so they, you know, so they stay disabled, and then it's kind of a downward spiral into invalidism. You don't do anything that's so demoralizing. I mean, we're all busy. You guys have never had, you're in school, you've never had a day not in school, except, you know, like kindergarten, maybe you went to, you know, preschool. I mean, you've been busy from the time you can consciously remember being a you know, alive probably, to not have a job, to not have a, that, that kind of place in society, and to not even have the social network from just seeing people every day, even people half the time you can't stand, but you know, it's, 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 you can't underestimate the importance of that and how devastating it is not to have it. So even though, again, these, these, these funds were it, all given in good faith, they ended up essentially financing this this really empty, unproductive lifestyle for a lot of these guys. And so that's what, you know, so I guess that was the beginning of it. Um, and um, Theodore Dalrymple is great. He makes, he, he makes me look like Pollyanna. Um, he's British. He worked in Manchester, which I've never visited, but I gather is one of the more depressing areas of, and, um, uh, although now he lives in France. And he's um, just prolific writer for the City Journal. So I guess my ans one of my answers to you is find outlets that um, you know, like this spin. I, I remember my fr the first thing I ever wrote was for the uh, Wall Street Journal, which tends to you know, like these. Let's say I wouldn't be writing for the nation. <laughs> Although the New York Times is, is, is quite receptive because um, they like the idea of, of somebody. I, I always thought, and I believe to this day, I'd never get a thing published in, if I weren't a, a doctor. They don't want to hear somebody else talking about um, you know, something in mental health. It's because you have the moral and, and intellectual authority of your, you know, this profession and, and use it. You, you you really get it. You'll, you got an extra um, step up already, you know, by being able to say, or even as a medical student, that's that counts. Um, you know, your night in the ER, and you know your what you saw, but how that has implications for some larger problem. And um, did that answer your question? Okay. Uh, so maybe we have time for one more question. I think. Um, okay. Yeah. You have like. Um, so, I have a question about kind of balancing the economic and kind of ethical um, weight of, of a situation. Say you're a, a provider in an emergency department. I used to work in emergency departments before starting medical school. And we would often see patients that were intermittently homeless, uh, you know, history of substance abuse, maybe um, psychosocial problems. 
And they would often come in because it was the only warm, dry place that they could find in the community. Uh, they could get a sandwich, they could watch TV. Um, and even when they were willing to try a detox or go to a shelter, uh, it was very cumbersome for them to uh, start that process and beds might not even be available. So pr from a provider's standpoint, um, what is the uh, like morally ethical versus economically feasible situation? Is it, is it right to board the patient in the emergency department or is it right to kick them out if they don't have an acute complaint? I, 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 whoever can answer that, I assume. Well, I, did I mean, I'll try. I don't know a lot about working in an emergency department. But, I mean, to me, I think of this more from the policy perspective and really getting incentives right and the funding right. Um, and so I think we do need to have beds available for people where it's not then leaving up to the emergency department to decide whether or not to let people stay there and perhaps enable certain things or just have very costly uh, nightly services. I mean, I personally probably would allow people to stay um, if it were me, but I think that, again, is the policy person's uh, job to make sure that we have the beds ready um, and make sure that we're using them in a very efficient way so that they're able to you know, use our resources efficiently. But no, I can't really speak to that exact situation. And do we have time? Is that probably it for? Um, yeah, OK, yeah. So, so thank you very much for the, the time. I really enjoyed your question. Thank you.